Okay. What the f So this week we're gonna do the flashbacks first and then we're gonna go back to the present day stuff and I'm sorry if there's not too much humor in it because there's just so much stuff that we have to unpack. Episodes that go in to make the villains three-dimensional characters are usually pretty fascinating, but with Ingrid's I kind of just went, so you made this huge mess and then this is how you're choosing to fix it? Like back in season one, the stable boy showed us how Regina became a villain and how her controlling mother and the tragedy of her first love's death kind of shaped her coping abilities for the present day. Rumpel wanted power to protect his son and now he struggles with addiction to magic and then Cora's past revealed a woman who would literally do anything to get more than what life had given her even though I'm kind of confused on how she married into being a princess and then she went to live in a farm, even though it was a pretty well-to-do farm. Hook's fault to villainy was for love, Pan's was for selfishness, and Zelina's fall from innocence was out of revenge. Ingrid's history is meant to parallel with Elsa and also serves as a dramatic what-if for Emma, where Ingrid pushes her sisters away despite their continued assurances that they loved her no matter what, Elsa came to see that her sister did love her no matter what. Rumpel said it himself that love is free and can do more than what his magic could, but Ingrid was too afraid and honestly too stubborn to work for her happiness, taking the easy way out instead. And that is what ultimately killed her sister. Actually, a lot of villains can be summed up this way, taking the easy way out. It's like Minecraft, kids. If you want to build a gold pyramid that reaches high enough on the y-axis that it completely maxes out, you gotta work for it. The villains on this show are astonishingly well-rounded, complicated characters if given the chance, but they all kind of have the same flaw they allow their fears to become their ultimate weakness. Regina feared her mother and losing any aspect of love, Rumpel fears being weak in general, Cora feared poverty and being seen as useless, Hook fears magic, and we will likely see that coming into play next week, Pan feared death, and Zelina feared being unimportant and abandoned. Ingrid fears being alone. However, like many of the villains before her, Ingrid feeds into her own fear as well by pushing away and not trusting her sisters to be enough for her and erasing all memories Emma had with her. I really want to see the payoff with all this because aside from accidentally killing Helga and then frightening Gerda, Ingrid has really written her own villain story. So now her solution to all of this is getting the ribbons back that she shared with Gerda and Helga and probably giving them to Emma and Elsa. I know my magical artifacts lore and I am pretty sure that because these were things worn by Gerda and Helga for so long that they have imbued some of their essence within them. This essence, combined with the really important reason for wearing them, can create kind of a magical net for whoever wears them. In layman's term, that means brainwashing. Ingrid knows that Emma and Elsa are stubborn and independent people and likely won't come willingly, so this is her backup plan. But seriously, what the hell is up with that ending? How did you get everything in the world to give to Rumpel, Ingrid? How can you trade the entire world for some ribbons? What kind of deal is this? And how can you whisper your plans into his ear and leave me fuming and wondering what you said? Stepping kind of away from Ingrid now, let's go to Emma and the story in the present. Thank you, thank you, continuity gods, for going back to the reason why Snow had to confess wanting other baby in the Cave of Secrets. Emma and Snow absolutely need to have this conversation, this confrontation. Notice how Emma has referred to David as dad on more than one occasion, but when she has to talk about her mother, it's always Mary Margaret. This hurts a lot when you remember how close they were back in season one, but with the whole mother-daughter abandonment rift between them, plus the new baby brother, they haven't really had time to bond as a family. And man, does Ingrid play on this. Ingrid is a master manipulator, twisting truths this way and that. If you want a classic example of gaslighting abuse, watch the interrogation scenes again. Ingrid is in complete control of that situation from the moment they ran into the clock tower. Also, hey Ingrid, it is completely possible that Neil also has magic because he was born of true love. Like, that's, that's a thing that happens. Come to think of it, think about all the magical babies that are in Storybook right now. Side note, speaking of babies, Babies! Oh my gosh, look at all the babies! And remember when I thanked the continuity gods earlier? Yeah, no, why is Alexander not like two now? This rift of anger and hurt that exists between Emma and Snow comes to a head after Emma's emotions wreck control of her magic, or was it the injury that she got from Ingrid? Snow is angry that Emma almost killed David, but this only reinforces the seeds of doubt that Ingrid had planted in Emma, causing her to run away and hide. And thank you, Snow, for realizing that your delicate relationship with her 
cause this, though I hesitate with your use of we. David was not a part of this. This was all you. I still have questions though, like shouldn't it have been kind of easy to get into the stations because it was like ice over glass? Why do the villains always go to the clock tower? Why do we have a running theme of sad, angry dudes playing darts? What the hell happened to Anastasia? Is the Duke of Wesselton the real villain here? Did Grandpommy make Gerda have a daughter with magic? Did Ingrid somehow get out of the urn and back to Rumple because how else did she learn how to control her magic? If David or Snow gets hurt, do the other one also get hurt because they share a heart? I have a lot of questions about this heart sharing thing. Will Robin and Regina stop being Ross and Rachel 2.0? And did they, I said a bang, bang, bangity bang, I said a bang, bang, bangity bang. And is anybody else spelling Miss Taven with a Y instead of an I? Okay, I know I missed a whole lot, but please let's go down to comments and continue to talk about this. This, but now our bests of this episode are... Our best dressed of this episode would be Sassy Henry in his suit. Oh my gosh, I just want to hug Jared. He's becoming such a handsome young lad. Though I think we need to do another time skip here pretty soon because he's not gonna remain 12 years old forever. <laughs> the best bro TP would be Captain Charming. And not only because they are best bros for life, but because they're both doing for Emma what nobody else had done for her before, and that is putting her first. Killian puts her first by shoving away his fear of magic to console her when she's having her magical freak out, literally not caring to get away in time when he is about to get his skull bashed in because Emma needs reassurance. And then David puts Emma first by throwing himself into danger by pushing Killian out of the way. David knows Emma would freak out even more if she caused him to get hurt. And the best everything goes to CSI Arendelle. Clearly, Anna takes after her Aunt Helga, thank God somebody around here has read the script and knows when there is some evil dude around trying to do awful things to their sisters. So, um, we're not gonna survive next week. It's a two hour long episode to make up with the fact that we're not gonna get one the week of Thanksgiving. It looks full of angst and pain and I'm, I'm still here for this. That's all I'm here for is all the angst and the pain, but ugh. I'm gonna try not to make the recap half an hour long, but I might not be able to warning you right now. So thank you guys for watching. I will see you with another video on Wednesday. Bye!